he walked into my life with an arrogance and determination that would later become his trademark. He just showed up at my doorstep and I looked into his big, urgent eyes and, and I thought, you've got to be somebody's dog. You're not a stray. You're too beautiful. He was. So you might need some food and maybe a checkup at the vet, but we'll be on our way and we'll walk around the neighborhood and for sure we'll knock on some doors and we'll find your home. And boy, was I wrong. I later called him Mosso. He was beautiful. He was a Sharpe Husky mix. Stubborn, hard to handle. And I for sure was not going to keep him. I already had four dogs of my own, which back then I thought was already an excess of dogs. <laughs> but so also was not going to be my dog. However, he was so beautiful, I knew I'd find a home for him and it'd be easy. And I, I wasn't completely wrong. I did find a great home for him seven times. Every time he was adopted, he'd be returned within two weeks. I'm sorry he keeps jumping into the neighbor's backyard. I'm sorry I can't handle him, he won't listen. I'm sorry he barks at the kids. I'm sorry he chases cats. I'm sorry he digs up my garden. I, I heard them all and, and they were true because all these irritating qualities about Oso were also the same qualities that made him this unique, unapologetic, self-proclaimed ruler of the universe. And for that moxie, he had my respect. But I guess after seven failed attempts, I was kind of thinking, am I going to have to keep this dog? And then you think, what options are there in store for Oso? Am I going to put him back on the street? No way. I already knew how corrosive that could be. Am I going to take him to a shelter? And by that time, I had seen too many dogs in cages, pacing anxiously, as if they knew that there was an unspoken expiration date hanging over their heads. And I thought, no. But hey, what else is in store for a dog that hasn't found a home? Nothing. So, also, and all his problems and headaches stayed. But he also came with a bunch of very profound lessons. One of them being that, no, being astray isn't equivalent to being a sick, flea-ridden, mangy dog. You can be a beautiful dog and be homeless because of people's indifference. He also taught me what I think is probably one of my most important lessons. He taught me that sometimes Doing the right thing will push you so far out of your comfort zone that you might never find your way back. But that that's okay too. And so, also stayed. And other wonderful dogs came into my life. And if I couldn't find a home for them, they'd stay too. And the more dogs I saw being overlooked, the more dogs I saw getting discarded because they weren't the ideal dog, the more my loathing for the system grew. Because yes, dogs have become another one of our disposable items, like plastic or obsolete electronics, old shoes. And in the back of my mind, I kept thinking, it's 
it's just not right. Uh, why isn't anybody doing something? How can this be acceptable? How can all these wonderful dogs have that to look forward to? And also I kept thinking, well, so why can't we have dogs live like sheep and goats on farms, free, guarded by humans, but free, being dogs? And of course I tried to get information from people, opinions, some from experts and some from laymen, and everybody came back with the same answer, no. No, no, you can't do that with dogs. No, 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 dogs are pack animals. And you put them all together, they'll just go back to their wild mentality and kill each other, kill everything around. No, 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 you can't do that. And I thought, that doesn't sound like the dogs I know. But has anybody tried and failed? No, 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 because you can't do that. It's just, all right. And at the same time, my house was getting full and by full, I mean 80, 100 dogs of wonderful dogs that nobody wanted. And it came the day that my husband sat down and he said, Negra, that's how he calls me, we have to do something. We can't keep harboring dogs. And I know you don't want to stop, but we're running out of room. How about we take our dogs to your grandfather's farm, we refurbish the old barn as their home, and they won't be alone. Of course, he must have seen the face, my eyes. And they won't be alone. We'll hire a family to live at your parents' place at the farm, and, and they'll, they'll take care of the, of the dogs. And I thought, that was scary, but it was my only option. So I remember coming back. We started working towards the plan but I wasn't ready I remember coming back from work on a Wednesday and they'd moved all the dogs to the farm and I came home to that empty house and the recollection that I I didn't know what was going to happen to the dogs on the farm so of course I cried every day till that Saturday when I finally could drive up to the farm. And when I got there, oh, I didn't know what to expect, but, but when I got there, I was greeted by the same group of 100 plus dogs that were always happy at my house, being exactly the same, lying around, sniffing their butts, chewing on sticks, digging holes, just happy. And we went on a walk with all the dogs and we went up hills, through pastures, through the rivers and the dogs were happy. They were being dogs. And by the end of that walk, I knew not only that it could be done, but that it had to be done. That we had to do whatever it took in order to make it happen. And I knew it wouldn't be easy. But complicated doesn't start to describe what this ride has been. For starters, we've had to stand our ground against a government that doesn't like us and doesn't want us around because we make them look bad. You see, Costa Rica is a bunch of, it's a very pretty country scattered houses all around and you see one dog on the street and another one over there and maybe in a few blocks you'll meet another one you don't notice how many dogs are on the street looks fine no problem but when you know there's a property where you can actually see thousands of dogs together you start to wonder what's the government doing about this and the answer is nothing they're not doing anything so keep in mind our property is 355 acres. It's not a small place. The dogs are not confined. But even though this is a huge farm, we still have to deal 
with complaints brought about us by neighbors. Our neighbors are farms, other farms, dairy farms. Our dogs can't be imposing on their peace and quiet because they're farms. But yet, people are uncomfortable. We first complaint I remember was sound pollution. Our dogs were creating sound pollution. Our dogs, much like your dogs at home, bark when they're excited, when they hear something, but usually they lie, they lie around. They're lazy. That's the same thing. Our dogs are the same thing. So the authorities came in, they measured, they had to dismiss it. Then somebody came up with the theory that it's the poop. Their feces are contaminating the floor, the ground. Luckily, we could prove that we rake their feces three and four times a day. We're always raking poop. Have no shortage of it. And we put it into sacks, the leftover sacks from their kibble, and we ship it off to the appropriate processing place with the receipts to prove it. So that was dismissed. Then the Ministry of Health comes up and says, nope, it's the urine. The dog's urine is seeping into the ground and it's compromising the aquifers. And I thought, you do realize there's thousands of cows around us <laughs> who pee and poop constantly. And you're not worried about them, but you're worried about my dogs? So, yes, what started as 100 dogs has become 15, 1,600 dogs, fluctuates. And yes, it's become more complicated, regardless of the government and the neighbors who come in and poison our dogs and cut our water lines and cut our fences. But aside from all that ugliness, there's the operating of, the, of this project to feed these dogs. We buy 66 pound sacks of food. These, these sacks cost about 30,000 colones, which is about $54. The dogs eat 20 of these a day. So that's just in food, it's over, a little over $1,000. Then every dog is spayed and neutered. That's $12 to $15 each operation, depending on the size of the dog. They are vaccinated yearly. And that's from $7 to $10 each every year. Then we have to pay salaries for the caretakers. We have to pay for the upkeeping of the property. But you know, we do it because it feels good, because we know it's working, because we have mountains full of happy dogs. We do it because we have to, because we can't stop doing it. Because as long as there are unwanted dogs coming into this world, begging, for love, we're going to feel compelled to try and do something for them, to try and provide either a temporary or a permanent home for them. You do this every day. We face the challenges every day. And we don't even complain because, you know, it feels really good to walk into that farm and see those dogs being dogs. It's never been easy, but it's always been worthwhile. And I guess what I'm trying to convey with this, not only do dogs need more help in this world, but if you no longer feel comfortable with the system you are part of. If the reality that you have been offered as a given 
no longer resonates with you. Find a new one. Envision a new one. And work towards that. Because if you feel you can bring any amount of change, no matter how big or small, do it. Don't be afraid to try it. God knows it won't be easy. But if you work at it long enough, and if you're faithfully true to it, no matter how many challenges are thrown your way, you will eventually accomplish something. It doesn't matter if it's small. Because even the smallest ripple in this reality, the smallest ripple in this system has the potential of becoming a massive wave of change. And it'll be your wave of change, the one you envisioned. And for it, the world, to some extent, will be a much better place. Thank you.